Welcome to Metabolism Matters. I'm Jennifer Woolley. This video comes to you from the American Society for Parenteral and Enteral Nutrition and GE Healthcare. Today we'll be talking about malnutrition and how that happens when patients are sick and perhaps in the hospital. Malnutrition can be characterized by patients losing weight, feeling weak and tired, and not be able to function as well as they normally do. How does this happen? Sometimes when patients have certain conditions such as sepsis, their metabolism goes up and they burn more calories. At the same time, patients may be in the hospital having tests where they are not allowed to eat or may be feeling bad and have a decreased appetite. They may also not prefer the hospital food or may be on a prescribed diet where they have some dietary restrictions. This may result in a caloric or energy imbalance. If a patient doesn't take in enough calories, they use their muscle and fat stores for energy. The result is weight loss of both muscle and fat. While the patient may want to lose fat, loss of muscle makes one weaker. When protein is used for energy, it is taken away from making tissues important for healing. Did you know that 30 to 50% of hospitalized patients wind up malnourished? And that approximately one third of patients who are not malnourished on admission may become malnourished while hospitalized? This is a problem because if a patient loses enough weight and becomes malnourished, they are more apt to have poor wound healing and become at risk for infections. When a patient suffers from malnutrition, they can become dependent on a mechanical ventilator. This means they will be in the hospital longer, which increases morbidity and mortality, as well as costs. Malnutrition is the enemy. It's the healthcare team's responsibility to prevent and or treat malnutrition in the hospitalized patient by providing proper nutrition. But how does the healthcare team do that? By using a variety of nutrition assessment tools and following the nutrition care pathway. One of these tools is a nutrition-focused physical exam to aid in the dietitian's nutrition assessment. Another tool is the use of predictive equations. This is what one looks like. Predictive equations are often used because they're convenient and inexpensive. Unfortunately, they have many drawbacks. There are hundreds of equations, there are no guidelines, and they are only accurate less than 40% of the time. Less than 40%? Let's get another tool, shall we? Let's look at indirect calorimetry. First of all, what is it? Indirect calorimetry uses expired and inspired carbon dioxide and oxygen measurements to accurately calculate nutrition needs. The coolest thing about indirect calorimetry is that it uses measured data. It's also objective and accurate because it's tailored to each patient. And it's not just me saying that. According to the Society of Critical Care Medicine and the American Society for Parenteral and Enteral Nutrition 2016 guidelines for the provision and assessment of nutrition support therapy in the critically ill patient, indirect calorimetry should be used to determine energy requirements when available. That means if you've been asked to follow SCCM and ASPEN guidelines, you should be using indirect calorimetry. So the next question people ask is what are the equipment options for indirect calorimetry? They include metabolic carts, handheld or tabletop devices, or an indirect calorimetry module built into a mechanical ventilator. If you want to know what your patient's energy needs are, use your tools. That way you can provide what they need with appropriate nutrition intervention. Well, that's all for today. I'm Jennifer Woolley for Metabolism Matters, and see you next time.